Well, we're going to see now that Isaiah 24, the language that we have seen about punishing the host of the high ones and confounding the moon and making the sun a shame and Yahweh reigning in Mount Zion, actually now those thoughts and scenes are expanded within Isaiah chapter 25. And uh, specifically now we're going to move from the generic, which is sun and moon, into cities. And the high, arrogant, proud, exalted cities are going to be brought low the nations will be humbled, and God's mountain, Mount Zion, is going to be established forevermore. So, so that's that's the thought transition. And that's very much like the structure of the apocalypse, where, where you have summary verses, and then you have an expansion of that information later on in the prophecy. So it's a very similar kind of approach in relation to the apocalypse. Let's look at Isaiah 25, shall we? O Yahweh, my God, says verse 1, I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. So we've had woes in the previous chapter. And now we have the prophet's personal exclamation of thankfulness and praise. He sees Jesus Christ, as it were, in vision, reigning gloriously with the 24 elders, that symbolic group of mature brethren and sisters in Christ, immortal and glorious, and he extols Yahweh for his goodness. But you see, the language that he uses is taken up by the book of Revelation. Thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels are faithfulness and truth. And that's precisely, we're not going to turn to it at the moment, precisely what Revelation 15 verse 3 says. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. There's that same recognition, the same thankfulness, the same appreciation of the wonderful works that God has done. Now, when you step back and think about that, Armageddon, second exodus where Elijah brings the Jewish people home, crushing of all opposition, the slow, gradual growing of the Daniel stone to fill the whole earth, they will be involved with wonderful things. They will be miraculous. They'll be powerful. They'll be shattering. Ezekiel 20 well, describes the second exodus apocalypse. where God extols Isaiah his high hand. Now, now, that's the language of miracles. He well, used that kind of language yes, in the first exodus. So and the earth is going to experience this so incredible sense that of the that divine that presence. For those who have the capacity to believe these things, they'll recognize the word of God. I know exactly what Revelation is saying as they survey this transition from man's rule to God's rule. Great and marvelous are thy works. Just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. And that was the language that was used by the prophet Isaiah. So even the language, thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. They, they, the word faithfulness they, they, they has the idea of fidelity and steadfastness and, and steadiness. And the word truth is a good translation. It means the truth. So the last chapter finished with the splitting of the earth, the staggering and tottering of the world, well, the collapse of human um, society, as it were. And in contrast, we and, have and the absolute the steadfastness of God. Yeah. See that, see that uh, contrast? Sorry, I, I, it is Isaiah. We are talking Isaiah. recognizes that, and the world will recognize that. That in all of this massive transformation and destruction, in the end, there will be stability and truth. Now, faithfulness and truth. For those of you who are at the Bible school, we looked at Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. This was the language that the Lord used when addressing Laodicea, the faithful and true witness. Come to Revelation 19. It's also the language that was used to describe the warfare. So the faithful and true witness now becomes the faithful and true judge. As I recognize that. As Revelation 19, verse 11, I saw heaven opened, he says. And behold, a white horse. Oh, do they? And he that sat Show upon him now, was called you. faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now, this is an interesting verse from a number of aspects. There is such a thing which the world has invented called a righteous war. So, for example, Ukraine defending itself against Russia. The West has termed that a righteous war. 
Now, here we have the Lord Jesus Christ imposing divine rule upon mankind and crushing every opposition that refuses to yield to that power. And there will be worldwide condemnation of that. Worldwide condemnation as a foreign power interferes in the political events of a country. But you see, John is being told that when that war is extended across the world, it will be in absolute righteousness and the judgment will be faithful and true. The Lord is not going to indiscriminately destroy those who have the capacity to change. There will be some who will survive. These will be the nations that come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And what John is assuring us is, is that in every one of those campaigns, in every one of those devastating destructions upon the world, the guilty and the evil and the wicked will be cut off in righteousness. And eventually the world will realize that. And this humanistic society that condemns all forms of warfare will suddenly realize that what Christ has done is absolutely right. Absolutely right. That's precisely what Isaiah in chapter 25 and verse 1 was singing about. Thy counsels, that the decisions that Christ will make are faithfulness and true. Because that's exactly what's emphasized in the apocalypse in that. So, verse 2 goes on to say, For thou hast made of a city and heap of a defense city a ruin, a palace of strangers to be no city, it shall never be built. And here we're introduced to this anonymous city. Here is the first of the wonderful things. This is the confounding of the sun. And we're now introduced into a more concrete figure of speech. We've moved from sun to city, deliberately hidden by Isaiah. Now, again, the context helps define the nature of the city. In verse 2, it's heavily fortified. It's a defense city. It's an unusual city because, you see, verse 2 says it's a a place of strangers, a palace of strangers. Foreigners occupied this city, an unusual city. And we find at the end of verse 2, it's never going to be rebuilt. So, so we're given a few clues as to the identity of this city. Heavily fortified, full of strangers, never be rebuilt. Well, the, the Hebrew there, defense city, really means uh, a fortified or inaccessible city. When the world looks at this particular city, it, it, it is seemingly untouchable. It's seemingly impregnable. The vastness and power and wealth of this city, how possibly could this city be, be removed? It's a city of foreign people. Come to Revelation 17. Where, where the idea of city isn't just a single place, but an empire. So here we have in Revelation 17, verse 1, where we have the seven angels, the seven vials talking with him saying, come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And this power is a city power. And guess what? In verse 15, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples, multitudes, nations and tongues so this city is a palace of strangers it is an amorphous mass of many many people some from czechoslovakia some from italy some from france some from germany all together in a single dominion called the city and this is where the language came from Secondly, it is a city which shall never be built. Now, there is only one city in the time of Isaiah where Isaiah said would never be built, and that's the city of Babylon. And this counterpart is very true. Come across to Revelation 18. This city will never be rebuilt. Revelation 18 and verse 21. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and it shall be found no more at all. So this unnamed city, the target of which is one of God's wonderful works, is going to be destroyed and removed. It seems impregnable. I mean, even if you visit the Vatican today, it, it is a, 
an awe-inspiring yet, yet crushingly awful place to go. It seems impregnable. It's roaring the world spiritually. As far as Christ is concerned, that city is to be destroyed and never to be rebuilt, never be seen again. And that's the first of the wonderful works that Isaiah describes. Now, the next point is verse 5, and we're only going to take snippets of these chapters. In verse 5, thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dry place. Even the heat with the shadow of a cloud, the branch of the terrible one shall be brought low. So the destruction of man's society, of this great city, is likened to God silencing the noise of the strangers. Now, where does that language come from? Oops, let's just go back. That's Revelation 18, verse 22, to Revelation 19, verse 1. Let's come to that, shall we? You see, we're in the context of a city disappearing, and we have this incredibly dramatic scene of God silencing the world. So Revelation chapter 20. Sorry, Revelation, sorry, end of chapter 18. Verse 22, the voice of harpers, musicians, pipers, trumpeters, it's almost like Daniel 4, isn't it? All of these gone. No craftsmen. Neither shall be found in thee the sound of the millstone. Shall never be heard at that time. Verse 23, the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. The voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride shall be heard no more. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sources were all nations deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints, of all that was slain upon the earth. So, so the end of chapter 18 has the shutting down of Babylon. And stage by stage, no more weddings, no more sound of merchandise, no more candles, it's dark. Then in absolute contrast, chapter 19 bursts out with the whole world giving praise to God. That's the drama of those chapters. And that was, that was foretold by Isaiah in this chapter. He's got to bring down the noise, the, the enormous din of this world. You know, one simple way that's going to happen is to turn off the Wi-Fi. And, and if technology is removed from the world, you have immediately shut down almost 80% of the noise in the world. Be silent, O all flesh, before God as he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. That's the message of Isaiah 20, 25. And Babylon is, is, will be part of that. Shut down. No noise, no light, gone. And then... Voices around the world singing praise to God. The heat. The shadow of a cloud. Now, that's why, brothers and sisters, that the imagery of clouds appears in the apocalypse. Because it came from this chapter. And, and just as the shadow of a cloud dissipates the heat, gives you a relief from the heat. It's precisely what Jesus Christ will do. A cloud. It's the language used in Revelation 10, Revelation 14. And verse 8 tells us, He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord Yahweh will wipe away tears from off all faces. Verse 7, God is going to remove the veil cast over all nations, all their stupidity, all their vain religion, all their philosophies, all their evolutionary ideals. And that veil will be ripped apart, starting in Mount Zion. And you can imagine, as Jeremiah said, with people coming to Zion and saying, surely our fathers have inherited Lies and vanity and things wherein there is no profit. They'll be ashamed. They're absolutely ashamed. The lights will be turned on. The, the ah, of course moment will hit the world. And in that context, we have the removal of all pain and suffering from the people of God. 
he will swallow up death and victory. It's the language of the banquet, isn't it? Quoted by Paul. But it's also quoted in Revelation. Let's come to Revelation chapter 7. He will wipe away tears from off all faces. What an astounding day that will be. Here it is, Revelation 7. These are they who have come in a great tribulation. In verse 16, they shall hunger no more, neither shall thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. You know, we all experience pain and some way or another. And whatever the solution God has, that will be removed and replaced with everlasting joy. And though we have tears over things that are tragedies in, in our life, in the glorious purpose of immortality, that is going to be expunged and replaced with everlasting joy. Now, that's an astounding thing when you think about that. Everything will be right. And those memories of pain and suffering will be replaced with everlasting joy. The former things have passed away. Revelation 21. Now, Revelation 21 is even more powerful. You see, because Revelation 21 <clears throat> the first few verses of that in fact, the first eight verses of this chapter describe the beyond the millennium, where the former heavens and earth, the millennial heavens and earth are replaced, and the whole constitution is changed, becomes brand new, whatever that constitution is going to be. So, so, so those who've gone through the millennium, those mortals who have accepted the truth, I believe, brothers and sisters, that, that even though the reign of Jesus Christ will, will be a glorious reign of righteousness and peace, the, the purpose of God in inducing faith under trial will still be in some measure part of God's purpose during the millennium. And there are hints in the prophetic record that, that Zion in the millennium will be a refuge for the oppressed. So, so even though we have righteous kings, even though we have righteous priests, even though Jesus Christ is reigning across the world, that, that purpose of inducing tried faith still has to be part of that operation. And there will be personal tragedies. The environment will be glorious, but there will still be personal tragedies. And people will come to Zion to seek consolation. And that's why in Revelation 21 verse 4, God will still wipe away tears from people's eyes. He will still remove that pain and suffering that individuals will, in fact, experience. And the power of that is in two steps. For us in Revelation 7, and for the mortals who are made immortal at the end of the millennium in Revelation 21. Let's come back to Isaiah 25. We're not going to speak about the downfall of the city again in Revelation 25, but we'll come to sorry, Isaiah 25, but we'll come to Isaiah 26. Because now we have, with the demise of the city of strangers, the elevation of God's city. So, so this is the balance. And this, isn't that the, the symmetry of Revelation? Rome versus Jerusalem. And finally, the fall of Rome and the exaltation of Jerusalem. And that thematic approach is within these chapters of Isaiah. The high city destroyed, God's city elevated. And here we have it in chapter 26 and verse 1. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. It will be a strong city. The continuation of the theme moves across. The two cities continues across. 
there's the opening of the gates, and that has prophetic links to Revelation, which we'll see in a moment. The themes of, Re of Isaiah 25 are now expanded further within Isaiah 26. Again, that's the structure of the apocalypse. Take a summary, expand. Now, a strong city, literally, Zion will become the strong city. Spiritually, it will be a group of people, the New Jerusalem, which God will appoint. Now, in verse 1, we have an emphasis on the walls. Come to Revelation 21. Because in Revelation 21, now moving back to the millennium, We have gates and walls. Verse 12 of Revelation 21, the city had a wall great and high. Now, now, now why did Revelation emphasize the walls? Because that's what Isaiah emphasized. Isaiah 60 talks that, about the walls are symbols of salvation. Gates praise. Zechariah talks about Yahweh being a wall, a protective wall of fire around his people. But it's the wall that was emphasized by Isaiah. And it's the walls that are known of that city in Revelation chapter 21. And Isaiah 26, 2 describes people entering in at the gates. Now, entering in is the language of the New Testament, isn't it? But it's also the language of Revelation 22. Let's come to Revelation 22 while you're there. Verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. And that's the language of Isaiah 26, verse 2. Strong city, powerful walls, walls of salvation, and the gate and only those who keep the truth are going to go through the gate. Not the liars, not the blasphemers, not those that work iniquity, the righteous shall enter into the gates. So, Revelation 21, verse 27, there shall in no wise enter into that city anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life, only those who keep the truth. Not just believe it, keep it. They are doers of the word and not hearers only. The truth has made the impact on their lives and they're doing something about it. Faith is being energized by love. They're fruitful in every good work. Those are the people who will be permitted to come through those gates. It's exactly what Revelation 22 said. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Keep the truth. They'll enter into that city. Let's come to the end of Isaiah 26, shall we? I know we're sort of cherry picking a little bit, but... For the purposes of this address, we really have another expression used by the prophet, the inhabitants of the earth. Now, that exact phrase was picked up to describe the Catholic European system. The inhabitants of the earth pulled straight out of Isaiah, placed the revelation. Because the it's a context here of when Yahweh comes out of his place. Initially Sinai, eventually Zion. And when he steps forth in the place that he's appointed, it will be to punish the inhabitants of the earth. And that phrase was used in Revelation 17 to describe precisely that. And it's for their iniquity. And the Hebrew expression is perversity, depravity, iniquity. When you look at Revelation 18, verse 5, we have a brief description of the Catholic European beast with its harlot control. The cage of every foul and unclean bird. I once saw a photograph of a couple of bishops with their hook nose in black garments, and I thought of these unclean animals, these birds with their beaks. It looked very graphic. There it is, their depravity, 
their perversity. And uh, you don't need me to tell you of the evils of the Catholic Church infecting the world through pedophiles to know the evil and iniquity of that system predicted by Isaiah in 26 verse 21. And also, the earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Now, the Hebrew word means to lay bare. Rotherham says, therefore shall the earth unveil her shed blood and throw a covering no longer over her slain. But that is interesting language, you see, because we have had brethren sisters who've been destroyed by that Catholic system, whose blood is in the earth, hidden from view, unknown by the world. And this verse is saying that one day, that blood that has been shed will no longer be hidden. It will be unveiled. And the covering which of ignorance will be removed. And these people will stand up, brothers and sisters, destroyed by this system, and that will be made known to the world. Now, you come across to Revelation chapter 18. Because, you see, when that Catholic system is attacked by Jesus Christ, a specific group of immortal saints are to be chosen to launch that campaign. And here it is in Revelation 18, verse 20. So she's made desolate. And in verse 20, rejoice over her, thou heaven, which is the political heavens, Christ in control, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Verse 24, in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Slain, that's the word from Isaiah 26, 21. Now, what the record is saying is, brothers and sisters, is, is that when the resurrection takes place and this group of people who've been butchered and murdered by the persecutions endured by the Catholic Church, they are the ones who are going to be in the forefront of rejoicing in the victory of destroying that system. And there's perfect justice in that, isn't there? Perfect justice. They will be in the forefront of that work. Rejoice, you prophets and apostles. Those who have been slain by her, they'll take the forefront in that. And there's an appropriateness about that. And that was seen right back in Isaiah 26. No longer will their blood remain unknown. They will stand once more in victory. Now that brings us to Isaiah 27, which was read this afternoon. Unfortunately, the chapter break has destroyed the connection. In actual fact, the chapter break should be more precisely in verse 2. The description of Leviathan belongs to the end of chapter 26. We're talking about destroying, slaying the enemy. Punishing Leviathan, that word punish has occurred back in chapter 26. The first thing we notice is in chapter 27, verse 1, that in that day, Yahweh with his saw and great strong sword. So we're introduced to a sword in that day. Remember, we're talking about the punishment of the inhabitants of the earth. That's the last verse of chapter 26. Okay, so we're talking about the punishment of this European system specifically. Saw, great, strong sword. Now, if ever there's an emphasis, there it is. Repeated, a great and strong sword. Come across to Revelation chapter 19. It's not just any sword, it's a strong sword. It's going to take an incredible amount of power to remove this system from the earth. So, the sword of Yahweh, Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. Verse 21, the remnant was slain with the sword of hints upon the horse. So the sword becomes the weapon of choice, if you like, the symbol of choice of judgment by Jesus Christ and his saints. And that's why in Revelation 18, verse 2, the angel that appears in verse 1 has great power. In verse 2, he cried mightily with a strong voice. In verse 18, when that cry went forth, it was a powerful force. You see, because that was the point 
of Isaiah 27, verse 1, to root out the superstition of Catholicism, of evil, of this world's philosophy, will require enormous power. It's not going to be done in a day. So Yahweh takes not just a sword, but a sore, great, strong sword. And he's going to punish Leviathan. So the word Leviathan is a transliteration of the Hebrew. It means the twisted animal and refers to some sort of animal that can coil itself around its prey. That's, that's the idea of that. I put a crocodile there because in the Leviathan chapters in Ezekiel, the Pharaoh is likened to a Leviathan. And because he's in the Nile, I thought a crocodile would suit the picture. It may not be a crocodile. Who knows what it is? But it suddenly appears in this description of the destruction of Europe, Catholic Europe. And because it's styled in the Septuagint, guess what? Dragon. The Septuagint translates this word, Leviathan, dragon. Now, that is the symbol used in the apocalypse. The dragon turns different colors depending upon the constitution, the history. But this dragon idea came from Isaiah 27. Not, not a beast, a dragon. This, this is the idea being presented. And also it's likened to a serpent. The word piercing there really has the idea of rapid movement. It's, it's swift. Come to Revelation 12. So we're introduced to a serpent power in Revelation chapter 12. That great dragon, verse 9, was cast out. That old serpent, Diabolos and Satan, to see with the whole world. It's there in verse 14, Revelation chapter 12. The woman given two wings, the great eagle, that she might flee into the wilderness from the face of the serpent. Verse 15, the serpent cast out of his mouth water. So it's a Isaiah symbol, dragon, serpent. It's crooked, coiled and twisted, and the idea is ready to spring, ready to strike. There's nothing upright about this power. And there is a second power. So we have dragon and serpent and now we have a beast in the sea a dragon in the sea and that's revelation 13 verse 1 i saw a great beast come out of the sea it's the base of daniel chapter 7 he sees the wind turbulent across the waters and out of the sea come these beasts now this is this is isaiah's language he he, he laid the foundation of that particular figure of speech a dragon that is in the sea. In verse 4 of Isaiah 27, we read that God no longer is angry with Israel. So we're in the context, aren't we, of the reformation and restitution of Israel's fortunes before the world. I'm no longer angry anymore. God says. So, so, so Israel has been saved. Israel has been forgiven. Israel has been justified. All is implied with that verse. And, and what God describes is, is, is any enemies out there, any briars and thorns, I'm going to just race through them. These briars and thorns will, will, will attempt to, 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 uh, to make war against me, but I'm just going to go right through them. And the language used is of burning them. In fact, Rotham translates that. I would march in among them. I would set fire to them one and all. And that's the language of Revelation chapter 19, where the one on the horse goes through, destroys the armies that are presented before him, and burns them one and all. We're going to jump down to verse 13. In actual fact, there, there is a, uh, a parenthesis from verse 17 to verse 11. And in that parenthesis, 
Isaiah looks at the nation of Israel in his day and laments the fact that they are still wicked. They still will be punished. They still will be judged. So, so that forms a little parenthesis. And, and the in that day of verse 12 really connects with the idea of verse 6, the day when Israel fills the land with fruit. And in verse 13, we have this picture of the trumpet that's been blown. Now, you're probably aware that the blowing of the trumpets is one of the judgments used in the book of Revelation, the trumpet judgments. Come to Revelation chapter 11. Now, Isaiah 27 spoke about the great trumpet. So, so once again, we have this greatness. Everything is powerful about this section from Isaiah. Now, Revelation 11, verse 14, the second world is past, and behold, the third cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven. Now, the trumpet in Isaiah is a symbol of the voice. Isaiah 58, verse 1, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. So the blowing of the trumpet, the symbol of judgment, is also a symbol of proclamation. And that's why in Revelation 11, verse 15, this angel sounds a great trumpet and there are voices in heaven. Okay, Something great. In actual fact, as we have there on the screen, it's based on the Jubilee trumpet when, when the land was proclaimed free and you could go back, every man to his inheritance. In fact, that's the imagery of this particular verse. The trumpet should be blown. Look at Revelation 14. Verse 14. Because we have here this powerful proclamation. Verse 6. I saw another messenger flying in the mid heaven having the everlasting gospel the gospel of the future age to preach to them that dwell on the earth to every nation kindred tongue and people that is a great trumpet this trumpet blast this sounding forth this preaching of the everlasting gospel is going to hit every single country every single country and, and the message is absolutely opposite Verse 7, it's a loud voice. It's a great trumpet. It's a great sound. Fear God. Now, that is going to challenge every single agnostic and every single atheist in the world. Fear God. Britain, like Australia, religion is on the decline. Atheism and agnosticism on the rise. So that will challenge every single agnostic. Fear God. Give glory to him. That will challenge every single humanist. Give God the glory. At the moment, it's man. All about man. Man's rights. Human rights. Man, man, man. This will challenge every single humanist. Give God the glory. Oh, that'll be incredible, won't it? And what about the evolutionists? Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fans of waters. And the whole scientific community is going to be challenged. It, how appropriate is that proclamation? How appropriate is that decree? And the world will resist that to the core. Of course, there are some nations, nationally speaking, that will support the return of the Jewish people. But basically, human nature is not going to brook the interference of a divine figure saying that same-sex marriage is evil and wrong. How do you think it's going to react to say there is a creator of heaven and earth and you need to worship him in spirit and in truth? <coughs> and all those who've never believed in God, the Hawkins of this world, to suddenly realize there is an almighty God. And part of that great proclamation that Isaiah described will be the return of the Jewish people back to the earth. An astounding event. And nations will have to work out. Will they support the return of the Jewish people or will they resist the return of the Jewish people? And that proclamation will divide the world. The word that's spoken will be divisive. Now that brings us to the 
end, if you like, of the Isaiah 24, 27 block of quotations. And I'm just going to finish off the next 10 minutes or so just to, just to illustrate, brethren and sisters, the, the power of Isaiah in Revelation. Uh, for example, there are, there are incidents of isolated quotes. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7, the Lord addresses himself as he that hath the key of David. And we looked at this at our, at our Bible school a few days ago. There's a deliberate link. And, and, and the reason for that link is, is that the Lord Jesus Christ is asking that ecclesia, Philadelphia, to actually go back to Isaiah 22 to search the context, to understand the different classes of people that reacted and to find themselves in that chapter. Are they fearful? Are they afraid? Or are they righteous? They're like Shebna, they're like Eliakim. And you'll find frequently that when the, when the apocalypse invites that attention back to a quotation in Isaiah, it's asking people to look at the context. Now, here's an interesting one. Revelation chapter 6. The seal in the end of Revelation 6 is actually, without proving it or going into it, is actually the change of constitution of the Roman Empire from pagan to nominal Christian. It's, it's the, the way in which Constantine took control of the Roman Empire. And at the time, it was so revolutionary, it's called an earthquake. And Eusebius makes the point that it, it was like the kingdom of God on earth. That's, that's, that's the point he made. And in actual fact, Revelation chapter 6, verses 13 to 14, describes this dramatic change of constitution in this way. Verse 13, chapter 6. The stars of heaven fell from the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. The heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together. Every mountain and island was moved out of their places. So, so revolutionary was it that the previous constitution, stars and sun and moon, absolutely removed. Now, in doing that, it uses the language of Isaiah 34. Come across to Isaiah 34. Now, Isaiah 34 is a chapter about the future judgments of Christ upon the nations. And here we have it in verse 4. All the host of heaven should be dissolved. The heavens should be rolled together like a scroll. All their host shall fall down as a leaf falleth off of the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. And you think, well, well why did the apocalypse quote a scene right out of Isaiah 34 when Isaiah 34 is talking about the judgments of God upon the world. And, and it really introduces a unique feature about the apocalypse that, that when it quotes in the Old Testament, it doesn't necessarily quote the historical application of that prophecy, but the essence of that prophecy. Now, the essence of Isaiah 31, 34 is the removal of the world's constitution and the replacement by a brand new system of government. Well, that's the way it's used in Revelation chapter 6. Sure, it went from pagan to nominal Christian, but it was so revolutionary, it was just like Christ coming and removing the constitutions of the world and establishing the kingdom. And you'll find that that's frequently the way in which some of these quotations are used. Now, look at, look at Revelation 6, verse 15. The kings of the earth and the great men, the rich men, the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Now, as we've got on the screen there, that's pulled out of Isaiah chapter two. Now, Isaiah chapter two is very similar. It talks about Yahweh rising to shake the earth. It's an earthquake. And people can be so distressed, they're going to hide themselves from the majesty of almighty God. So the apocalypse pulls it out and says, well, even though it's talking about Christ's coming, the reaction of the world in hiding and shame is precisely what was experienced by these people as the pagans ran for their lives. In our Bible school, we, we saw the invitation by the Lord to the Ecclesian Laodicea to buy off me 
And that language comes from Isaiah 55. And for those who are at the school may remember that the context of Isaiah 55 is that you don't have to pay money for the truth, but you actually have to put in the effort, incline your ear and come unto me. So you see, the contexts are significant in all of these things. Now, in some of the examples of, uh, of quotations, we find, in fact, there's a grouping. So Revelation chapter 4, which describes the Lord sitting upon the throne, surrounded by the four living ones with six wings, crying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, is, in fact, a quotation from the first three verses of Isaiah chapter 6. So we find in some of these situations that when the apocalypse quotes in one verse from that chapter, later on it'll quote another verse from the Isaiah 6 and another verse. So, so you find that it quotes context, not just isolated quotations. Here's another grouping of chapters. See how Isaiah 53 verse 7 Isaiah 54, verse 11, and Isaiah 55, verse 1, which are consecutive chapters in Isaiah, they're sprinkled across the apocalypse. That allows us to understand, really, that, that Revelation is quoting vast context of what Isaiah is speaking about and just dropping those little quotations throughout the apocalypse. Then there are other groupings. Revelation 21 pulls in Isaiah 60, 61, and 62. So it's asking us to go back to those chapters in Isaiah and, and absorb the atmosphere of those chapters and bring that same atmosphere and that same relevance into the chapter in Revelation 21. And Revelation 21 is a glorious and incredible scene. First seven verses is beyond the millennium, but the rest is all about the millennium. And it's a city. Isaiah 60 describes as extremely busy. The gates are never shut. People pouring in to build and rebuild. Think about the destruction that Russia and its confederacy will make across Israel. There'll be absolutely devastation. And when the earthquake shakes that country to the core, Ezekiel 38 says there won't be a wall left standing. The enormous rebuilding of that society, the construction of houses, think logistically. Where do I get the material from? How do I build the houses? What sense of architecture do I use? How am I going to get all the labor to actually rebuild this wonderful constitution and establish it as the nucleus of God's kingdom? Now, that's Isaiah 60, the frenetic activity of nations pouring into that. And Revelation pulls it out and says that's exactly what's going to happen spiritually too. Labor and zeal and industry of the saints, reshaping the world, bringing the glory of the nations to Zion, <laughs> teaching them, educating them, removing the veil. Our last quote is Revelation 22, verse 12. We'll conclude our session on this particular quotation. It's a quotation from Isaiah. Revelation 22 and verse 12. Behold, I come quickly, suddenly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. That's a quotation from two places in Isaiah. Isaiah 40 verse 10, Isaiah 62 verse 11. The context of that is remarkable. The king is coming. The Lord of all the earth is here. And he has a reward to give every man according as his work shall be. So, so, so whatever, whatever our activity is in ecclesial life will be rewarded, for good or for ill. We stand but it's on the threshold of that return. We stand on the threshold of his coming. And when he comes, time will stop still and we will give account of our lives to him. And he will issue his rewards for good or for ill. The apocalypse is an astounding revelation that we as a brotherhood have been given the wonderful privilege of understanding through the labors of pioneer brethren. 
a glorious heritage that we should never forsake. That prophecy of Revelation has behind it the great prophets of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah and so on. And, and today we've just had a, a brief glimpse of the drama of Isaiah. I hope it's given us an impetus to be able to examine these things further. May it be beneficial when our Lord comes. We may be faithfully blessed in those that not only hear and understand, but keep the words of this prophecy. Thank you.